Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of Leeds University in Business School and the University of Leeds. My name is Katerina Prezi, and I'm a senior teaching fellow within the marketing division. I'm very pleased today to introduce such an exciting masterclass entitled Succeeding with Digital Marketing in 2015. And I'm honored to introduce our guest speaker, Dave Chaffee, who is an expert and an opinion leader in the matter. Before I can start, however, I need to do some housekeeping. So in case there is an emergency, the alarm, the alarm will ring. I don't expect anything to happen, but in case it does, we need to take action. So you are asked to leave the lecture theater through the emergency exits and make your way outside the building. OK. So this is a master class. The master class series has been running for eight years now at the university. During this time, Leeds University in Business School has grown considerably. We are research-led faculty. We have about 120 research active member staffs. We conduct research, rigorous academic research on a number of business related areas. And of course, digital marketing is fertile ground for new research. As far as our programs are concerned, we also have evolved with time. In our marketing programs specifically, we include modules to address these challenges. We have modules on digital marketing and modules on social media marketing. We also include digital technology in our teaching. So in our classrooms, the iPads are the notebooks of our students. We support and communicate with them through virtual portals and through applications. So it is a pleasure indeed to have Dave here. We find it very fitting with what we do, also because Dave is an alumnus of University of Leeds. <coughs> But today, we're not here to look inwards. We're here to look outwards to the digital landscape. This landscape is rich, complex, and challenging. Digital technology promises us the ability to view, listen, connect, and engage our customer as ever before. However, digital technology is a challenge and a promise at the same time. How businesses can strategize in this context and implement those strategies is very much an open question. Our customers are vocal, they are connected, and therefore they also are increasingly skeptical of traditional marketing techniques. So we look today to really understand this digital landscape in which consumers are co-creator and co-producers with us with what we do. And today, I'm very pleased to see that Dave is here with us to share his expertise to indeed prepare us to face these challenges. Dave has been regarded for a long time now as a guru of digital marketing, one of those individuals that helps to shape the discipline. He's the mind behind the Smart Insights website where he regularly shares his knowledge of best practice to help businesses plan, manage, and optimize digital marketing. He's also the author of the leading e-commerce and digital marketing textbooks. And in fact, many of my former students who have now left the nest and they are working successfully in digital marketing have first come into contact formally with this subject through Davis textbooks. So without further ado, I shall leave Dave the honors to talk to us. We are very much thankful for you coming here and we look forward to what you have to say. I believe that Dave prefers to have questions during the presentation in addition to the end if there are more questions. And afterwards, please join us together outside for some drinks in the foyer and further conversation. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Dave. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Katerina. And good evening, everyone. It's uh, really nice to be in, in Leeds, actually. A bit more uh, history on uh, me. I, I am an alumni. Uh, I probably don't talk about this that much, but I, I didn't study in the business school, but rather in the, uh, the earth sciences department, and my PhD is in geochemistry. Uh, I got a visit down to St Helena in the South Atlantic, and I spent my three years crushing rocks. Um, so I'm probably not giving the best impression there of my, uh, 
my ability to talk about digital marketing. But actually, while I was studying my PhD, I went straight into um, analysis and chemistry, and that's what I worked in. This was all pre-digital marketing, of course. Uh, so, so I've been fortunate to be involved in digital marketing from uh, the beginning, and I'll be showing some, some of my uh, lessons in this, in, in this session. Um, it's also nice to speak here because I actually spoke for a couple of years uh, the, the, uh, the programs on international marketing and advertising. Uh, I, I taught the students. Some of you may be in those programs now. That, that was before I launched uh, Smart Insights. Okay, so what are we looking at? You can see from the, uh, the, uh, the wheel here that we're very much focused when we're looking to the year ahead on what will be the, the investments businesses can make which will give them the biggest uh, growth. And uh, that's where we're going to focus this evening. I've picked out 10 areas which I think are important for companies to compete online. And uh, I'll also be getting some feedback from the businesses in the audience as well to see uh, what works for, for you. Um, before I start, just a note on, I, I like to share everything on uh, SlideShare. Uh, I, I think with digital marketing, often the, the devil is in the detail, as they say. So uh, in some cases, I've got links through to other websites, other resources. Uh, but if you go to slideshare.net, Dave Chaffee, you'll be able to uh, download the deck. It's not there just yet, actually. It's, there's one from Portsmouth there, bizarrely, which is where I, I come from originally and where I was this time uh, last week. So, but I, I feel coming to, uh, to Leeds is a bit like coming home as well because I, I met my wife here and Smart Insights is actually based in Leeds, although I'm uh, based in Derby in my home office. Okay, so uh, as Katerina was saying, uh, I've been fortunate to uh, get in early, if you like, and develop these books originally on internet marketing and we've evolved these so that we're now on the sixth edition of the one at the bottom there and we update those every three years you'll see that in digital marketing, a lot happens in three years or even in uh, three weeks. So with Smart Insights, what we've developed is a, a freemium resource. So we have a lot of free content in our blog and available for our basic members. And uh, we also have paid membership as, as well with more detailed uh, information. In fact, I was talking with uh, Samantha in the marketing team here in the in, in the business school, heads that up, and uh, she's actually a, uh, an expert member of Smart Insights, and it was her who invited me here, so uh, thank you. So uh, yeah, plan, manage, and optimize is our uh, strap line. So we try to go beyond the, the details of social media and search marketing and look at the big picture of how to create uh, a strategy. That's really our point of difference uh, with, with what we offer. So, into the uh, material, and let's start looking to the, the future. And I've got a question here for the, the businesses in the room. What I'd like you to do is to choose just one uh, of the five areas in, in the slide here, uh, which you think will give you the biggest growth in terms of your commercial returns, new business, or, or customer retention. So I'm just going to ask for a show of hands for each one of these. Uh, content marketing. Anyone going to opt for that one? Just one? Thank you. Two? OK. Well, that's, uh, we'll see what the others give. So uh, conversion rate optimization. This is about boosting uh, online sales for a retailer. If your conversion rate is, let's say, the average is about 3%, if you can boost that by a small amount, it's a big return. So there's quite a lot of focus on this. What about in the room? Yeah, quite a few there as well. Thank you. Mobile marketing? Oh, we're seeing quite a balanced approach. Thank you. Yes, uh, Samantha from the, the business school marketing team was saying uh, they're currently working on a mobile optimized site there. And we'll look at some examples of that later. So on to the two of what I see as the, one of the most uh, or the most important tactics and channels in digital marketing, search and social. So how many for search marketing? Thank you. And social media, anyone left for that one? Wow, 
Now that is really strange, <laughs> because I, I, as you might have gathered, I, I talk quite often around, around the trends, and uh, usually it's, it's reversed, so content marketing is, is the big area of, of focus. In fact, um, what I tend to do about this time of year, I, I, I do a blog post and I ask this question to, uh, to, to the readers on our blog. And if you look at what people, how people respond, um, content marketing, where we had hardly anyone at all, that's usually the most popular uh, topic. And social media and search are actually quite, um, quite, quite small in, 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 as a proportion. It's, it's not academically validated research, it's just a poll getting uh, fr fr from our read readers. Uh, so I think I'd better explain how content marketing, social and search fit together because for me, that, that's really the, one of the best ways to make businesses uh, successful. So we're going to start by looking at content marketing. And this is an example of uh, one of our pieces of content developed on Smart Insights. We actually work with a Leeds-based agency, First 10, to develop a lot of our uh, infographics, as they're called. And if you're working in business-to-business -business marketing, I found this a very good approach to to, to generate awareness for our brand because people share these and hopefully they position us well, well also. So how do, th this, this chart really explains, I think, how search, social and content marketing fit together. I've certainly heard a lot of companies say we need a social media strategy, we need a more uh, structured, planned approach to using Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and, and, and so on. But I, I'm not sure that's actually the, the best starting point. I think the best starting point is often uh, the, the customer engagement side and thinking what Katerina was saying in her introduction. That's our big, biggest challenge. There's so, many, uh, so much competition online. It's how can we engage our, our audience? How can we attract them to the site in the first place? And really, since day one, content has been the way to, to do that. I think what's changed in the last few years, and that's why there's a focus on content marketing, is we're going beyond content describing products and services to content which is actually really engaging and shareable. So people will, um, will, will share through social media. So the way that we see it is that you do need this central hub. It could be um, a blog if it's a business site. It could be a news section. I think with Asda, for example, they had a, a customer magazine. But the key point is you've got to have incredible content which will actually cut through and, and differentiate you in the marketplace. And a bit later I'll show you something called the Content Marketing Matrix, which is a way to help you review the right types of content. So what we're really trying to do, and we've done this at Smart Insights, is to build a, uh, what we call a content marketing machine where we're able to draw in new visitors all the time because we're constantly uh, adding new content. And we would create maybe two or three blog posts every day. To do that, we'll share them in social media through Hootsuite and other tools like Octopost to schedule them. Um, but what we also do, because if we think content marketing is two words, this is actually what we're not so good at, is uh, we'll, we'll do outreach and partnering with other sites. So I might I would take the time to work with the people who publish the Chartered Institute of Marketing website and to write articles uh, for them. Uh, I formed a partnership with, with UBM, who run a lot of the, the marketing conferences in the UK, to, to help share our content. So the, the, the advice I would give uh, in terms of online marketing is to devote as much time as you can to forming partnerships with other, with other sites. Uh, my, my colleague, Paul Smith, who, who's written another book with me, uh, E-Marketing Excellence, he says that that's really the seventh, the eighth P of uh, digital marketing. So just to uh, complete the picture, as Katerina was saying, uh, social media and content gives us a great listening device so we can see what, uh, what our audience is, is interested in. And, uh, Having the right tools to help with that is, uh, is a key part of the whole, the whole cycle. Uh, just, to rent, just to give you one practical tool to think about, there's a new tool called Buzzsumo, as in sumo wrestlers. 
Um, it's just coming out of beta and it allows you to give either a topic or the URL of a competitor and it will show what their most popular content is. So it can spark ideas for your own content marketing. And then we've got the, uh, the big uh, Google box in the bottom left. That Google in the UK, of course, is uh, about 90% plus of searches. So if you're not visible in Google, you're really not visible at all. And, and that's why SEO is so important to us. We're able, uh, at Smart Insights, we get about a quarter of a million visits a month. That's so about half a million page views. And most of those are from, from Google. So uh, it depends on the strength of the brand. If you are someone like Asda or John Lewis, then SEO isn't so important because the, the awareness is, is still there. But it's still, it's still pretty important for, for most businesses. So let's look at an example of how this focus on content can help uh, businesses. This is actually uh, a company based in Leeds that my co-founder, Dan Bosomworth, that uh, he works at Smart Insights and First 10, the agency. He, he was their marketing director and he was actually using content five years or so ago before everyone was talking about content marketing. They, um, the, if, you, if you visit this site, there's a great example of what people are now calling the fourth wave of content marketing, which is interactive. So rather than just a download, if you go and try this Tefl Taster, it's actually like an interactive quiz and it's educating you about the brand. A really smart piece of marketing and it actually generates thousands of leads for them every month, I think. Uh, so a, a, a good example of what you can do. This, this company, I'm not sure whether she was a Leeds graduate, but uh, Deirdre, the, the founder of this company, she, I think she was inspired from a trip to, uh, to Vietnam or somewhere to launch the site and she sold it to TUI, the German travel company, for seven million after three, three or four years. So again, the power of digital marketing there and content marketing in particular. There's also some not so good examples of social media. Do any of you know, do you look at this with your students? You, uh, you should. It's, uh, a lot of companies are doing pretty dumb things on uh, social media. And this is called the condescending corporate brand page. Um, a lot of companies, are just, it just seems, are driven by likes on Facebook. And so they're asking things like Asda here. No, no one from Asda here tonight in the social media team, I hope. Do you like summer or winter? An easy way to get likes if you're remunerated. Uh, on that. So that's, that's a fun page to, uh, to, to check out. And then in terms of video content marketing, um, this is another example of how not to do it. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of videos like this. We think first of vague words that are synonyms for progress and pair them with footage of a high-speed train. Science is doing lots of stuff that may or may not have anything to do with us. See how this guy in a lab coat holds up a beaker? That means we do research. Here's a picture of DNA. There are a shitload of people in the world, especially in India. See how we're part of the global economy? Look at those farmers in China. But we also do business in the USA, or want you to think we do. Check out this wind energy thing in Indiana, and this blue collar guy with dirt on his face. Also, we care about the environment, loosely. So, tree hugging. You, you, you get the picture. It's. Uh... A lot of people think, yeah, great, online marketing, do, we'll do video marketing. It's actually really difficult to, uh, to get right in practice. And you see so many corporate videos like this, uh, not quite as bad as this, but they don't engage the audience. They're not well thought through to think of the pain points of, of, of the consumer or, or the business. So uh, it's getting digital right does need a lot of research and uh, re real close attention to the customer needs, which I'll come on to in a, in a moment. 
OK, so uh, I'm now going to go on to the, these 10 areas to consider with your digital marketing. And they're based around this, uh, this race framework that we've developed at, at Smart Insights. So it starts with uh, developing a planned approach. And then it, it looks at the classic marketing funnel in terms of how we reach our audience, how we raise awareness for the brand, um, how we interact with them. That's often a, a challenge online, getting interaction, conversion to sale, and then the long-term engagement, ad advocacy, customer retention type activities. So uh, we will break the, the, the talk up into four or five parts. And uh, Katerina was saying we'll take some questions part way through. So it'd be great if you can think of some questions in the context of what we've just been discussing. And then uh, we'll take them as we, as we go through. So let's start with uh, planning. And, and strategy in particular. Now, another question for the businesses here. If I went to your offices and said, OK, how is it looking with your digital strategy? How many of you could point me to a defined plan for digital? Maybe integrated into a marketing plan, but either way, details on digital. Could I have another show of hands on that one? Thank you. Seeing quite a, a good number there. That's great. But we might expect uh, more. Uh, we, we've actually asked this in a, a more structured piece of research uh, back at the start of the year. And there were around half of businesses who don't have a strategy. So what you might seem as uh, commonplace in a, in, in a business school, um, we, we, we're not having that. So, so what, what sort of problems do you think this might give uh, if, if we don't have a strategy? Could I have some suggestions from the floor, please? We forgot to mention that it's, uh, we, we, we're hoping for some interaction. So who can I, who can I pick on? Who, who could uh, suggest some potential problems? Measurable goals. Measurable goals. And then if you don't have the goals, you've got nothing to track against. So how do you, how do you improve? Thank you for getting us started. Raise your money and give a illusion uh, of your brand image to the audience mm -hmm. to destroy what you Put, uh, the put in the past. Right. So it okay. The past. So are you saying there's duplication of investment or investment in the wrong places? Investment, actually, the finance investment in the wrong places. Wrong places. And the other uh, investment is the past investment. Right. Will, uh, yeah, so you're just repeating business as usual. Yeah. Okay, thank you. A couple more. Thank you. The, the marketing will be holistically looked at as a business, yeah. so they're not. Integrating the marketing. That, that's a very good point. And I'm probably, I mean, you might be thinking this listening to me, but I'm, uh, when we talk about digital strategy, that can be a problem because you create silos where people are working in digital and they don't work with other teams and we don't have those holistic campaigns. So part of a digital plan is to, as it says here, um, a good way to approach it if you don't have a plan is initially to define it into, into a separate plan to get the investment. There's a lot of discussion at the moment about what's called uh, digital transformation. So you have a short project to move to get your act together with digital, and then it becomes part of business as usual, which is the green uh, area here. So uh, thank you. Uh, were, were there any more? OK, that's, uh, that, that's great. I, I think the other thing I would say, and this relates to your point, it's about how can digital support the brand. There's a great opportunity to add value to a brand through the interactions. But if you don't set, set that out and think what's your, your um, online value proposition, we call it in the books, then that's missed, uh, missed potential. So on to number two, and um, apologies if you're at the back. This might be one that probably works better if you're looking at it on a screen or you download later. But as part of planning, digital gives us a really rich uh, way of targeting our audiences more closely. Uh, I saw an interesting case study with Saxo Bank, and they were looking to reach wealthy individuals. So the sort of thing they could do, for instance, is to uh, use Facebook marketing to reach people who are interested in yachting or golf or those sort of uh, activities that you might, you might expect with that, that audience. So there's a whole host of uh, targeting options that you need to review and decide the best ones for you. I've just picked out a few here. And I thought um, 
I, I, I would concentrate on this idea of personas. So these, these certainly aren't a new approach. I, I first heard about these in about 2004 when I was working with a, um, what used to be called an e-business manager in uh, HSBC. And they were using this to uh, personas to create more uh, relevant customer experiences for people uh, using the HSBC website wor worldwide. I then, they then cropped up again, and the reason I'm using Dulux here is that uh, their agency, agency.com, at the time, I think it was about 2005, they used them to create more relevant experiences for, for, for Dulux. So you can see it's really getting into the mindset of the, uh, the, the, the different personas there, what, what media they're consuming, type of sites, wh where, where they, um, where they socialise online, and then defining those. Now when Dulux actually, if, if you take a look at the full case study, they've actually got six different personas and five of them are female because the research showed that in this particular buying process uh, the women are, are, are most uh, influential there. And this is the, uh, the primary persona here, Penny. She's the one they're most looking to appeal to. And there's actually someone who it's a challenge that they're not sure what they're looking for they want to be inspired. So the, uh, the panel here, uh, inspiration, is, is what uh, Penny, the, the content that was developed to appeal to, to Penny. And if you actually look at, uh, that, that was the Dulux website back in uh, 2005, as you'd expect, it's still colourful. We've got a, a mobile responsive design now. Um, but it's still got messages to appeal to, uh, to, to the likes of of uh, Penny, I think when you when you drill down further into the in, into the site, if you're working for a, a business audience, again this um, this approach of personas can can be applied. Uh, this is for HubSpot uh, that some of you working in business may know. Do any of you know or use HubSpot? If you, if you don't, and if you work in business-to-business -business marketing, I'd probably say, I'd say they're the, they're the um, best example of how to use content marketing and social media together. Probably search as well to grow a business. They were recently listed on the, the New York uh, Stock Exchange for a uh, billion dollars um, valuation. And that is, is solely really through their, their, their content marketing and their, and their branding but based around their, their audience. They're actually another one of our partners, so I've made the effort to go and partner with them as a, as a much bigger player than us. So the third area of planning, I mentioned this in passing before, OVP. This is about how we can support a brand uh, through our online presence. So start with the persona, think of what will appeal to them in, in terms of engagement, which supports your, your, your commercial goals as well and then develop the content to support that. So a very simple example for us, we're all about strategy and planning. So we've developed a, a guide, a template to developing a digital marketing plan, and that allows us to get several thousand leads a month because it fits our, what, what, what our personas are, are looking for. But as we were saying before, we do need to integrate this back into our whole communication strategy. And if you actually look at Dulux, I noticed uh, last night they've got a campaign running, a TV campaign, and that, that will then link through to the, uh, the web experience as well. But whether it's business or consumer, lots and lots of different ways of getting this sell, inform, entertain balance right. Incidentally, utility, uh, Jay Bear, he's a, those of you who said uh, you were interested in social media at the start, he's one of the big uh, com commentators in the US on social media, but his latest book is all around this idea of the OVP and developing content, lots of good examples in there of how to do that. A couple more examples, I, I actually work with um, a rival of Purina uh, Nestle, um, we, we actually think this is a great way to do content marketing by creating a more, uh, a more simplified experience than you would see on many websites. So we're actually limiting the choice, which is what the research shows we must do, and, and then we can be more effective 
in, in our content marketing. So this is about si people signing up for samples. Now, I haven't got so much uh, academic research in, in this particular talk, but I, I've always felt this was a, 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 one of the, the great uh, two by two uh, matrices in, in, in strategy. Because if you look at a practical level, what businesses do in any sector, they copy each other and they're missing out on this, this, this top uh, green area on the top right there. That, that's the trick to really differentiate and then communicate that. Because the, the time you have to do that online is so, so brief that uh, you, you have to be effective. And one example of a company that does this is uh, Swift Cover, the insurance company, not the, the easiest product to engage. But if you think of the customer journey, it starts in with Google, either on a generic search or when someone's looking for the brand. And you can see there's very clear messages there about the, the, the speed of the process, which, which fits the brand. But why I like what Swift Cover do is that they, they develop their messages through the customer journey. Uh, I, I don't think they've still got Iggy Pop um, as, as a brand ambassador, probably because uh, a drug, uh, a reputedly drug-taking uh, rock star is probably not the best uh, thing to associate with the brand. But um, what they do do well is this why choose us. That's really why I'm showing you this example. So few companies do get those, um, help people make the choice, help them decide. And they do it in different ways through the customer journey. So you can see they've got the money, uh, money supermarket accreditation. They've got testimonials at the top. So convincing, uh, persuading people is, is one of the key roles of the, the, the digital marketer. And that, that's what they're doing well here. Another example of uh, the OVP. And you'll, you'll know ASOS as the fashion brand based in the UK that's that's done pretty well. I think they're not doing so well recently, but uh, I think the bulk of their income is now from overseas. And they've had this challenge of getting people to buy into their brand. In this case, it's the Australian site. And very quickly, you've got to, to try and convince and reach your, your, your target audiences. So one of the, t the practical techniques ASOS are doing, you may not be able to see this, but a lot of retailers do this, is that across the whole site, they have those three bars which explain what's on offer. And one of them is specifically for students. So they're able to have that sense trail, as it's called, to appeal to them. But uh, I, I like ASOS as a, from a teaching perspective, because often in their, their annual reports, they're quite transparent about the marketing approaches they're using. And a couple of uh, years ago, they, they talked about a conversion rate optimization project where they changed to this design. If you'd have gone to this site two years ago, it would have just been one massive image uh, of, of lots of uh, trendy 20-somethings, uh, I guess. But they, they have worked a bit harder at messaging now, and you can actually see quite big increases in their conversion rate through doing what you might think was quite obvious and even unnecessary. Keep it brief on this one. Uh, wouldn't be a problem for ASOS as a fashion brand. They're probably the, the best brand uh, to, to be successful in social media. And they are fantastic at the, the way they approach that and their content marketing. But for more traditional brands, this can be a big problem. If, you're not, uh, if you don't have shareable content, you don't have a character, you won't be successful online. And this. Uh, this book by Rohit Varga, based at Ogilvy One in New York, is one of the best books, I think, explaining how brands need to change and develop their, their personalities. <coughs> one particular tactic that can help with that, and you might not expect this in all sectors, um, is, is YouTube. This is some of the latest uh, consumer research from uh, TNS, Google, and, and Ogilvy again. Um, it's actually looking at all the influences, if I remind myself. Um, so for recent purchases of cars, beauty products, and smartphones, so fairly diverse. 
but it, it shows you that uh, YouTube is increasingly important in, in, in that area. Uh, that, that's, this has become very clear to me in the last year because my, my youngest daughter has just switched from 12 to 13 and she's stopped uh, watching TV completely and spends all her time on, on YouTube. And uh, if you don't know about YouTubers, they're incredibly uh, influential for girls and, and, and boys of that, of that age. Okay, a bit of fun now. I talked about personality. Any, any of you know the, uh, the Lings Car site? Um, I'm not sure. Well, it's, it's just fun. I'll, uh, I'll show you it. Apologies if you've looked at it too much. It might hurt your eyes and your ears. Do we have a sound control on here? How do I turn the sound down? Right, I worked it out. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that Ling is a contrarian. She, uh, she, you may know her. She was on Dragon's Den, and she's based in the northeast of England. Um, but there's a lot of best practices in web design, and she just throws them all away. I wonder whether I can uh, stop this. It's probably a little annoying. Um, Okay, we're just burning your eyes out now. Um, so yeah, one of the best practices is that everything should fit above the fold on a, on a web page and you shouldn't force people to scroll. Actually, where people have uh, studied this, that's actually one of these myths of digital marketing. You may know the, uh, the Amazon page scrolls multiple times to the bottom and Amazon has tested that because they know it's more, um, so they know it's more effective. Uh, but if we just scroll down a bit, we'll see the pain doesn't stop. It just goes on <laughs> and on and on. So, uh, but a lot of, I, I, I like this because of the, the effort that's been put in. And uh, often, oh, you like that bit. <laughs> you can trust me, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, but. Uh, we will often discuss these on Smart Insights or e-consultancy uh, of the effectiveness of this site and Ling actually popped up on the discussion and, and, and um, said how this approach had been quite effective to her. Um, wh whether she could have grown her business to be larger using a different technique is, is another question we, uh, we won't go into. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that one there. So. Um, yeah, I've probably got uh, yeah, 15, 20 minutes or so. So it'll be a good time to break for questions now, if you have any so far. Thank you. I'm um, very interested in your, your um, first persona thing. Oh, yes. Uh, because I've sat in various meetings where we've looked mm. at personas. And my, my impression is that all you do is push your own sort of prejudices into it. <laughs> So, yes. for example, I sat in a meeting in Holland where mm -hmm. um, a special sort of person was going to buy a certain right. tram, right. tram for that baby. Uh -huh. And this person, what they saw and what she watched and where she mm. went. And, and the reality was that when it came to selling the pram, mm. it didn't sound to that person at all because mm -hmm. the people who buy 600 pound prams are people's mums and grannies yes. and, and not that person. Mm -hmm. And to me, it just, it just all it does is... is Put your own prejudices on who will buy this product. Whereas somebody like Steve Jobs came along mm -hmm. and he didn't care who bought it. He said, You need this product. Right. And went, no, we don't. He uh -huh. said, Yes, you do. And we all bought it. Yes. So he told his audience what it needed. Mm. He didn't try to kind of get inside its head in that way. And I think you can very easily get to Right. I, 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 I get the impression <coughs> you're not a fan of personas. I think it's a are, are they? It's Okay. There's always a, an unexpected factor, right. like the granny factor, I know. Probably, yes. That, that comes yeah. Way. Okay. Interesting. Yes. When we do the, or when I used to teach on the IDM uh, qualifications, we used to have long arguments about the positives and negatives of personas, and uh, you're quite right to highlight what one of the negatives. But why I think they're useful and important is that they do give you a customer-centered perspective 
with often with a lot of businesses, there's a focus on the products and the services, and the web designers aren't thinking about the customer needs enough. Uh, that, that doesn't mean they're a panacea and you've shown some of the weaknesses there. But I would contend that if the research is right, then they do help with uh, simplifying. And they do stop this uh, hippo opinion. Do you know hippo? This is where the, you have the highest paid person's opinion. And they say, it must be this way, like, like with Ling, for example. Um, so uh, may, maybe she's thinking more about products and brands. So really, really interesting uh, comment from you there. And I can, uh, uh, I, I can quite appreciate what you're saying. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Yeah, please. Thank you. We have a, an unusual phenomenon, perhaps, perhaps not. Uh -huh. And that is that although we're getting our 3% conversion rate, um, we have a huge number of people who go on the home page to read about our history, because we're trying to live a long history. Right. And we're not getting a very large number of those people coming mm -hmm. across. Yes. And what suggestions and ideas do you have for linking the home page better with the selling part to get right. across? Interesting. Yeah, I, I definitely believe in a data-driven approach to this. So it's about understanding the customer journeys through the site and then making sure. So for instance, it may not be that it may be the case that a lot of people arrive deeper in the site. I think a lot of companies have a, a problem that when someone arrives deeper, it's not explaining the, the proposition. So you do that well on the home page from what you're saying, but do you do it well elsewhere in, in the site? Uh, but with, with analytics, you, you'd have, you can separate out that audience of uh, first-time visitors and you can ask them questions, you know, is it clear what should we be saying? We've used a tool on Smart Insights called Qualaroo where we will actually say something quite blunt, like what, what is stopping you buying now? And we got some really useful feedback on that about pricing. So you, you, you could do some either in usability labs or, or by using these interactive feedback tools, I think you'd be able to refine what you're doing. Uh, I'd, I'd like to look at it sometime, but uh, it's, it certainly sh shows the sort of challenges you can have with explaining the proposition. Thank you. OK, let's keep moving through. I'm conscious of the time. Um, so yeah, customer journeys we've been talking around quite a lot. I've mainly put this in for students. Uh, a great way if you're doing a case study assignment to think about the customer journeys. These days we don't talk about the individual channels so much of search, social media. We group them under the paid owned earned heading and this agency is for their, they've just cut off at the top there, brand experience map is showing all the different touch points where you need to try and reach your audience through, through different types of, of media. It's a really good way of understanding a sector for the first time. And another technique which is related to that, we had the comment about integration before. Um, this, this is from BCG, uh, Boston Consulting Group, looking at the, how the customer travels from one digital channel to a physical channel. And we think, what's the best signposting to facilitate that? So this is another technique that goes alongside personas. So with, uh, with Reach, we've got our traditional textbook view of the, uh, the toolkit here. Uh, it, since we're short on time, I'm just giving a single tip, as I was mentioning early, for many businesses working on search marketing is, is, is going to give them a, a boost. For ourselves, as I said, it's about 75% of visits. But what we need to do is, again, be customer-centered and think of different types of searches. So you imagine someone looking for accountancy services locally or, or nationally, they might have these sort of phrases. And we need to make sure in Google that we're visit, uh, visible for those. One of the great things about Google is that it does level the playing field. So uh, where I'm based near, near Nottingham, it does give uh, those tailored results by location. So Smith Cookson are in a great place there because they've got their their search engine optimization right. Looking at other techniques for digital marketing, 
This is way, way too complex to go into the detail of it here, but what I wanted to show you was there are so many paid options which are evolving. You know, fa Facebook is uh, offering new options every week, as is Twitter and LinkedIn and Google. So the most successful companies have got this sort of fail fast approach. So when a new technique comes out, they won't wait for a year and see what their competitors do. They'll, they'll task a team to try the new technique. Um, so for example, um, f Facebook have got their FBX retargeting, uh, custom audiences, they released another new one. Instagram, you can now advertise on. So it's really about constantly running tests with new types of media and finding the sweet spot in the bottom right here and then investing more in, in that. One of the practical techniques there that we found successful is uh, remarketing. I'm sure many of you have been a victim of these as a consumer. So this is where you go on a brand website and you then see the reminders which follow you around. Do you know these? That damned annoying, aren't they? But uh, they are effective, as, as you might expect from, from the repeated frequency. I think most people should, most businesses should cap them and not repeat them too much. But they, they are a, a good technique for many businesses in different sectors, different sizes. So we'll now on to the, uh, the areas of interaction and conversion. We've split them out on Smart Insights because Many people, as, as they visit a site for the first time, will bounce off within 10 seconds. It's quite scary if you look at the, uh, the analytics. And uh, that means we've got this challenge of using our content and our messaging to engage people initially. So how can we do that? Well, this is what I was saying to the, the gentleman here. It's about understanding the customer journey and thinking, wh where do people arrive? We did a survey on this recently, and um, while the home page was seen as important, there are also many other types of pages which are actually more important in uh, achieving engagement and, and conversion. Uh, so in Google Analytics, there's a tool called the Content Drill Down, which shows you the footfall across the site. And for retailers, it's often the product pages which have the most touch points by, by volume. So you can use analytics, but that will only give you the hard numbers. You only get the often most useful feedback on what you actually need to change by reviewing real people and doing real research. And because I'm in Leeds, I, th I, I popped in this slide from uh, Simple Usability. They've been, we've been partnering with them, uh, sharing some of their research of retailers. And uh, they're, they're actually one of the leading um, usability companies for, for doing these sort of tests. So you can see the type of problems that they would I identify. With uh, Fatface here, there seems to be a, a problem with their navigation, uh, which you would hope a web designer or a marketer reviewing the web design wouldn't make that mistake, but, but they do. So uh, that, that's why it's so important to, uh, to do these practical tests. Briefly, mobile is, is increasingly important. Uh, John Lewis, in their latest financial results in September, they revealed they now get over half of the visitors to their site on mobile, just as was predicted by Mary Meeker a, a long time ago. Um, so it's clearly important that the, the journey, that, that the experience on the mobile phone is good. Um, and a lot of companies do now have res responsive sites this recent re research showed. But around a fifth of businesses didn't have a mobile optimized site just yet. OK, sorry for going a bit American on you here with uh, kick-ass. But I wanted to emphasize the importance of just not being average when it comes to content. And really having the best content you can in your sector, even if that means producing less volume of content, but more quality of content, which will allow you to get the cut through. So this is the tool that we recommend. And what I'd suggest is you think of different types of content. So the more emotional content top left, uh, more rational content bottom right, 
and the content over on the right, this is more further down the funnel, so as we're getting someone to buy. Uh, so, so benchmark this against your competitors and then really think about which, which content works best for you. When, when I run this in workshops, we often find it's in the top left. There, there's often not so much content because that's more difficult content to produce and get right. So the virals and the videos and that, that type of content. So yeah, that, that's just an example from, from a workshop. And uh, there's a whole lot of criteria that the, uh, I think I was, Samantha was saying this earlier, it's prioritizing where to focus is, is the tricky thing. Um, so we need to have the right criteria in place there. If you're looking at content marketing, one of the uh, resources we refer to a lot is Velocity Partners. They uh, have a lot of good ideas on how to create content plans, editorial plans. So I've just popped a couple of examples in the deck here, which uh, there's the saying now, every business is a publisher. And this helps businesses become more, more like publishers. So conversion, conversion to sale, either online or offline, because we're living in a, a multi-channel world for most businesses. And I'm going to talk a bit about this approach of uh, CRO here. And uh, re really show you, we were mentioning this figure of 3% of conversion rate. If you went into a store, I think the conversion rate is nearer 50%. And, and this video shows nicely what, why businesses make it difficult uh, for, for, company, for people to buy online. Hey, just that, thanks. You sure? Uh, yeah. Username? Oh, uh, Nick M? No. Nope. NM1983? No. I, uh, Zandy Pops? Sorry. <clears throat> Zandy Pops? No, OK. Don't worry, I'll help. What's your postcode? Oh, it's uh, GU749ZT. Welcome back, Nick, forever. Oh, okay. Please listen carefully to this bread license agreement before continuing with your purchase of a loaf of bread. If you do not, blah, blah, blah. You also agree not to use any bread-based products for any purposes prohibited by United Kingdom law, including without limitation of design, development, manufacture of missiles, chemical, nuclear or biological weapons. Tick. I'm afraid you've timed out. What? Sorry. He Hello? Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Hey. Just one loaf, sir. Yeah, we just... What's your username? It's Nick Forever, but number four, not the... Gotcha. Yeah. OK, I'm just going to check that you're a real person. Could you say that for me? That's not even a word. OK, how about this one? You know what, forget it. it, it or this really... one? Uh, Hippo Potter Mice. You're in. Great, I'm in. £8.85. It's supposed to be 98 pence. Plus express delivery. What's that? Oh, well, it's express delivery. It's fast. So there's, um... Standard. Uh, standard. Standard delivery. That's four pounds ninety nine. Why? Bread insurance. You didn't untick the don't decline bread insurance option. You know what? I think I'll risk it. It is quite close to the sell by date. Don't care. Ninety eight pence it is. If you want to pop back in five business days, it'll be ready for your collection. Well, well, well I need it now, obviously. Oh, okay. Uh, you want the take home today price? Well, that's three pound twenty seven. You know what? I'm going to go. Come back soon. I won't. So, it can be pretty frustrating, can't it? And that's why we need to use Google. That, some of you may, may know that from Google Analytics from a couple of years ago. And, and using the qualitative uh, research as well. <coughs> Challenge we have here, I think, is the mindset in a lot of businesses, yeah, every business has got a website, but who's responsible? And is there a continuous process of updating it um, to make it work better? The research here showed that many businesses, it's, it's well over a year since they did a major update to the business, uh, to the business website. So the sort of model we would recommend is that it's a continuous process and every 90 days you're working on a new area of the website. So optimizing the home page or looking at different types of landing pages and uh, running tests continuously. So more and more businesses are doing that. Um, we, we presented this at e-commerce expo recently and you can see there's about a third of businesses 
the second bar down there. They're not really looking at this at all, which if digital has become one of the main channels to market today, that, that's clearly a missed opportunity. And uh, I, I saw this, this was presented at e-commerce expo by Shop Direct, I think. And th this is really the state of the art in a big company. You can see they're running more and more of these tests to avoid the sort of problems you saw in that checkout video. So they're ramping up to doing 100 tests uh, a, a month by, by next year. And, and you do fail. A lot of the activity will be wasted in that it could actually make things worse uh, rather than better. Now, if you're looking at marketing internationally, this becomes even more difficult because we have uh, this cultural customization that people talk about with their online marketing. This is clearly the, uh, the UK version, but what about other countries? Now, this is actually the original Challenger uh, homepage design. They ran a process called uh, multivariate testing where they were able to swap out all the individual elements of the page, so the, uh, the picture, um, calls to action, bu buttons, you, you, and, and so on. And then when they repeated that in different countries, they found a very, uh, very different types of approaches are, are needed. You can probably guess this is the German approach, which is very different from the Dutch approach. And uh, in Australia, it needs to be very direct, so just fix my glass, make the, the offer very clear. Um, now, that, that company, they invest um, tens of millions in doing these sort of tests, and they do see the, the returns. But the good news for smaller businesses is that if you use Google Content Experiments, you can do similar or simpler A-B tests. So one of the things we did um, is to compare these two pages. So let, let's do a quick A-B test here with the audience. How many of you, uh, you can see where this is our paid membership offer, how many of you would say the version on the left would be most effective here? I won't be offended if you don't choose that one with my picture on, thank you. <laughs> and on the right? Not, not many, yeah. The, the one on the right is actually the, the first one, which we kind of launched it in a bit of a hurry, and we didn't do the visuals properly. And we actually got a CRO consultant in, and he said, ah, oh, you've got to have the, the people picture and have the clear reasons. But we actually found that my, because people didn't know me, or most people on the web wouldn't know me, this explainer video on the right was actually better than I was at converting people. So that was a bit of a, a blow, but uh, <laughs> hey, you know, the, the audience can't be wrong. So, uh, so if you go to our site now, you'll see we've, uh, we, we focus more on that explainer video. So we're, we're coming up to uh, the time. So on, on engagement, just following on from what we've said, this is really the looking at social media and email marketing, <laughs> which I probably underemphasize the importance of that. It's, uh, we can again look at this in the, from a research-led perspective of understanding what's the gap between what people are looking for from an online brand and what's actually being delivered. And uh, I, I mentioned when we were talking about the questions, there's a whole lot of great tools we can use to understand loyalty. Um, so this is just some of the ones that, that we would use to get feedback uh, over and above what you would get in, in Google Analytics. We also need to look at um, customer service as, as part of this. And uh, live chat is a, is a particular approach that many businesses have found to work very well as a bridge between the, the passive online experiment, experience and then getting someone on, on the phone to, uh, to solve the problem more, more quickly. Now, you, you're probably also thinking that I've underemphasized social media. Uh, particularly since most of you put your hands up for that at the start. But the reality is, despite all the hype, if you look at most sectors, social media doesn't drive direct sales. Uh, th this is actually from Forrester, one of the big US analysts, and they, they wrote a post saying Facebook and Twitter do almost nothing for sales. And they found that even when you looked at multiple touch points to conversion, 
It's these other areas like uh, email, search, display, which are driving most of the conversions. So I'm really debunking the hype a bit on, on, on that one. Uh, but I, I believe the average for a US retail site is somewhere around 3 to 5% of sales are directly influenced by social media, which do, does make me think whether businesses might spend a bit too much time on it. And then it's a very fickle, um, audience is very fickle with social media as well. I'm sure you've heard that Facebook is, uh, uh, people are falling out of love with Facebook, particularly teens. I've got, my, I talked about my younger daughter, my elder daughter, who's uh, just coming up to 18. She's not on Facebook at all these days. It's more Twitter and, and, uh, and uh, running her own blog, that sort of thing. And uh, the interesting area right now in this area is whether there's room for, for any more social networks. And the latest contender is, is Elo. I don't know if you've heard about this. It's in the press quite a lot at the moment. The idea is this will be ad-free. It won't have the privacy issues that you have with, with, with Facebook. Uh, but rather bizarrely, since it's a social network, you can't actually log in at the moment. It's, you've got to request an invitation. Has anyone actually managed to get access to this? Yeah, yeah, I've requested, but <laughs> no, you know, brick wall. Uh, so we will see. I, I, I don't think it will work, judging by their use of courier uh, alone. But um, <laughs> we will see. So my final uh, area is marketing automation and looking particularly at email and web personalization. This is uh, from a Manchester-based business uh, agency that does a lot of work with helping retailers, financial service companies use email marketing. Email, as we saw from that, that chart, still does work really well because we can deliver personalized messages. And while most companies might be at the top and they send a simple welcome email um, or they they follow up when someone buys for the first time. The sophisticated companies are, are, are sending hundreds of different varieties of tailored emails with dynamic content. So this area of marketing automation is, is sure to be a big area for investment next year. And an example here of the type of welcome sequence which is more sophisticated. So not a simple thank you for registering plain text email but a whole series of uh, nicely branded emails. Maybe overdoing it, but that's what you'd need to test. And again, WH Smith's testing their use of email and getting big, big boosts from, from running those sort of tests. And uh, the final example, Horford's, that was before they ran email, uh, marketing automation, just a couple of automated touch points but then they've introduced a lot more to link in with their social media marketing as well. So that's our final example. And my, uh, my parting message is really, you're probably thinking the businesses amongst you all, there's so much to do, where do we prioritize? And it's the same for everyone, of course, and the targets are changing too. So whatever the size of company, it's a very long journey before we reach the nirvana on the right. So I think to develop a, a strategy, you have to be quite clear where you are now and then develop a roadmap. So one of the tools we've developed on Smart Insights for businesses to discuss internally is where they look quite closely in the areas on the left there, their capabilities. Where are we now? Where do we need to be? Because if you're at level two or three, you're not going to get to level four or five in six months' time. It, it really is uh, a, a big transformation that, that's needed. So thank you for uh, listening and uh, the comments we, we, we've had there. Uh, I'd, I'm happy to, uh, to talk on, on, on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't know if we've got time for any more questions now, but uh, thank you for listening. I hope that's useful.